I'd like to welcome everybody out tonight. We thank everyone for traveling so far. My name is Shiloh Logan. I'm the president of the BYU Freedom Society. Uh, you've all come to see our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Jack Manette. He has been kind enough to come and speak to us. Uh, first, a few things about the BYU Freedom Society. We were organized two and a half years ago for the purpose of understanding the Constitution, understanding principles of freedom and liberty. Uh, freedom is a rare thing in the world today, and it seems that those who understand the principles of freedom perhaps are a little bit even more rare. And so we decided to create a forum where we could have such institutions and such meetings as we are having tonight where we can invite men who is spiritually enlightened as Dr. Manette to come and speak with us. So we may learn the principles of liberty and freedom, uh, wherewith that we may know that God has made us free, that we are not free by any other means but by the Lord and by the principles as stipulated in Scripture. And for those of us who are LDS, we know from Latter-day Prophets that this is true. So the BYU Freedom Society was created to, as you can read on the board, to understand and actively support rightful liberty as well as constitutional law, both the tradition in the tradition of the Americans, America's founders and in harmony with LDS doctrine. Dr. Manette has degrees from BYU and a PhD from the University of Utah. He has 13 children. He's married to Margie Worthington. Uh, he has written in, uh, three books, Revealed Educational Principles and the, and the Public Schools, John Taylor, Educator, and the one that most of us are familiar with, Awakening to Our Awful Situation, Warnings from the Nephite Prophets. He has taught with the LDS Church for 30 years and, and has served as the Chamber of Commerce President, State, uh, State Right to Life President, and various school boards. And if you can give me a warm welcome for Dr. Manette. I appreciate that. I appreciate being here and the, uh, the invitation to come. Perhaps, you know, we've got some people here that, uh, that I've been fairly close to over the years. And do you mind if I just make some introductions here? Some, some people that, uh, that I'm very fond of. Uh, many of you know Stephen Jones, Dr. St Jones. Why don't you stand up and just uh, say hi to you. And uh, Steve has become a dear friend over the last couple of years. Uh, we have down here two people I work very closely with, uh, Mike and Patty Adams, and if you'd like to stand up also. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they have had private schools. They still have a private school, uh, but... Uh, very much involved in the things that you and I are involved with. And then in the back, most of you know Brian Meekham, or if you don't know him, you, you need to know who he is. Good man. And Brian has done a lot to help us. Uh, and has a great website. I, I hope you uh, hope you get in to, to look at Brian's website there. He has a lot of things. Now, I like your contest that you have now, Brian. <laughs> it's writing about awakening to our awful situation. Um, you know, with that, let me introduce some things also, uh, things that have, have come to me that have been meaningful and perhaps uh, help me to, uh, in these presentations, to gear them maybe better than they have been in the past. Let me share with you an experience that I had just uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was invited by my own ward to give a fireside and I've given several firesides over the years, and, and they've been good because generally, we uh, we they aren't uh, an invite everybody type fireside. They're like this: you know what you're going to get when you come here. And instead, people said, "Oh, Brother Monette's giving a fireside. Let's go to the fireside." And we had people from all over the spectrum, from every uh, uh, you know. Some had a great deal of knowledge and things we're talking about now. Some had no knowledge at all. Some thought I was uh, subversive, that I came from a different church. And, and we had uh, just all kinds of things happening. And after the fireside was over, my wife looked at me and she said, I have never heard you give such a lousy presentation in my whole life. <laughs> and we had hands going up everywhere, you know, and they're all on different issues. And, you know, one person said, Federal Reserve and they, they couldn't understand where we were coming from with Federal Reserve, and they thought that was, uh, that was strange. And then finally the bishop's wife stood up, and she said, you know, as long as we obey the commandments and have a righteous family, that's all we need to do. We don't know it. He needs to know any of these things. 
And, you know, it was kind of difficult with the bishop's wife saying that, and I couldn't really say, well, you're wrong. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we just kind of backed off on it, but it was a very poor presentation. And because of that, I have come to understand the importance of kindred spirits and working together from the same foundation. And I'm, I'm going to make an assumption here that many of you are on the same page that I am. Uh, and I don't know that for certain. There may be some of you that are not. But we're going to talk about some things here that we generally don't find in history books. We generally don't find in Sunday school classes. But at the same time, that doesn't mean they're false. It just means that we're looking for other places for some things that have come up which impinge on the things that you and I are doing today in our society. Well, with that... How many of you have your scriptures? You may have scriptures with them. A few of you, good, I'm glad. And if you've been to my talks before, we normally will we'll go back to the scriptures. And what I'd like to do, all of you are familiar with this already, but I want to go through Ether chapter 8 with you. You know the, the scripture already. You know the chapter. But I want to go through with it just to lay a foundation for what we'll be talking about, which really are secret combinations. Um... The book that I wrote is called Awakening to Our Awful Situation, Warnings from the Nephite Prophets. There will be another book coming out, uh, hopefully by summer, and that will read Awakening to Our Awful Situation, A Short History of Gadiantinism in the Promised Land. And we'll go back and we'll look at secret combinations and the things that have happened in our government and in the country and in the world uh, going back really to about the 1700s. And uh, it's amazing. You know, we don't think those things are there. We don't think they're, they're accessible history. If you look, they really are. These things are not such hidden things that uh, only a few people know them. However, they are secret combinations, meaning what? You do have to dig a little deeper because it's not known, it's not on the front page news, but it's there. Well, if you'll go to, if you have your scriptures, look in um, Ether chapter 8. And again, that's our foundation. As we look at this, I want you to look at that last verse in the chapter. And the last verse says, I, Moroni, am commanded to write these things that evil may be done away. Moroni says that he's commanded to write the things that we find in Ether chapter 8. Now, as you have read the scriptures, and you know them well too, that in Ether, the whole book of Ether, in fact, is uh, we told, we're told it's about a 100th, not even a 100th part of the 24 gold plates that Limhi had, uh, had found. And because of that, we know that they've been really sorted through, and we have... Uh, Moroni gleaning just the very, very best, the things that he finds the most important for readers in the latter days to know. And so I think as we look at Ether, we can say this book is a shortened version of the Book of Mormon. At the same time, it's the warning for those latter day readers of the Book of Mormon. So he spends a little time. He talks about, uh, if you go to Ether chapter two, he talks about America, the land here, the land of promise. And over and over, and three different times in four verses, he'll make the statement, if they do not live up to the covenants and commandments they've made, they will be destroyed. It'll be swept off, he says. And he's very definite about that. Well, then he talks about how their nation became swept off, and he's commanded to write that for us. And I'll begin with some of the things here in Ether chapter 8. And you recall the situation that uh, you have a situation where uh, Achish is, is uh, brought in to uh, fend for the, the king. In reality, he's supposed to kill um, for Jared. He's supposed to, to kill uh, Jared's father. And because of that, then Achish is going to pave the way here where uh, the secret combinations can become a part of the Jaredite society. Well, he goes on to talk about them specifically, and once Achish does that, and he works with uh, the daughter of Jared, who does kind of a Salome dance for him, and all of us are familiar with that, hopefully not too familiar. Um, 
Verse 14, it came to pass, they all swear unto him by the God of heaven, and also by the heavens and by the earth and by their heads, that whoso should vary from the assistance which Achish desired should lose his head, and whoso should divulge whatsoever thing Achish made known unto them, the same should lose his life. They've entered into a secret combination. And in that secret combination, they have sworn with each other by their lives that they would not tell anyone else what they've done and who they're involved with and how they're going about their secret combination. But it's very successful. And you recall in that, to lay the way for it, you remember that Jared's daughter had gone to him and she said, Do you remember what they did of old, the records they had of old? And didn't we bring those with us? And let's go back and look at those records. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting about secret combinations, remember it really starts with Cain, doesn't it? Remember Cain making the statement, he said, I am Master Mahan, I've learned the grand secret, I can murder and get gain. And from that point on, we have a combination that develops because he makes the pact with Satan directly. Well, that's the kind of thing that continues. And of course, when they talk about leaving the old country, you know, prior to that time. I don't know how many of you have read, I hope you have, uh, Nibley's work on the world of the Jaredites. Remember that? If you haven't, uh, you need to look at it. It's an old book, but it's uh, excellent. They're talking about the Jaredites. And the fact that Nimrod, uh, back in the Tower of Babel, had the secret combinations. He was, he was Master Mahan at that time of those secret combinations. And those were the records that were brought over. Interesting that Nim, Nimrod was an individual who planned on world conquest, didn't he? He planned to be the ruler of the world, the known world at that time. And so those are the same records that come down. And then continuing with those records, uh, verse 15, it came to pass, thus did they agree with Achish, all the people that uh, had swore and so forth and done the, the oaths and covenants, did administer unto them the oaths which were given by them of old, who sought power which had been handed down even from Cain, which we talked about, who was a murderer from the beginning. If there is an earmark of secret combinations, it has to be that word murder. Over and over, murder comes out. The, uh, the lack of value of human life and what can be gained by the death of another. And if you look in the book of Helaman, you look here in Ether, you look, Alma talks about it. Murder is rampant, isn't it, in the Book of Mormon? Um, good thing that doesn't happen today, isn't it? Um, maybe it does. Verse 16, And they were kept up by the power of the devil to administer these oaths unto the people, to keep them in darkness, to help such as sought power to gain power, and to murder again, and to plunder, and to lie, and to commit all matter of wickedness and whoredoms. And thus they formed a secret combination. Then the Lord, or Moroni continues, he says, I, Moroni, don't write the manner of their oaths and combinations, for it hath been made known unto me that they are had among all people, and they are had among the Lamanites. And they have caused the destruction of this people of whom I am now speaking, the Jaredites, and also the destruction of the people of Nephi. And so he pins that destruction right to the secret combination. Oftentimes in teaching Sunday school, we say, oh, the Nephites were overwhelmed by the Lamanites and they lost because the Lamanites were uh, bloodthirsty and victorious. There's more to it, isn't there? There's another element here that we often fail to use and fail to bring out, and that is the secret combinations. And as Moroni said, that was really the reason, the subversion that was done by the secret combinations at that time to thwart the, the government of the Nephites and of the Lamanites, and again, instill that whole idea, look, you can murder and get gain. Wasn't that kind of a, a Lamanite thing all the way through the Book of Mormon? Murder and get gain. Nephites, you're gone. We get your cities now. But even more than that, again, we're talking about the government. If you look in uh, Helaman especially, they had sole control of the government and all the things that happened as a result of these secret combinations. Then... And here's, I think, where you and I come in, because now he's writing for us. He said, I don't write the manner of their oaths and covenants, hath been made known unto me, they are had among all people. They are had among the Lamanites. So if they're had among all people, then that's worldwide, evidently. 
And whatsoever nation shall uphold such secret combinations to get power and gain, until they shall spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed. That's the word he uses at the beginning of the book also. They'll be destroyed if they uphold secret combinations. None of us have done that, have we? He couldn't be writing to you and I. He must be writing to somebody else who's reading the Book of Mormon. Um, uphold, he, he mentions one other thing too. He says, Wherefore, ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be shown unto you, that thereby ye may repent of your sins, hmm. and suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get above you, which are built up to get power and gain. Evidently, O ye Gentiles is who? The other guys, huh? No, that's us, yeah. That's us. Uh, President Packer, uh, in a talk he gave here at the Y a few, what was that, about six or eight months ago, mentioned that, that same thing. He said, sometimes we excuse ourselves when the word Gentile comes up in the Book of Mormon. Don't be excused. That's us. And so with that, somehow we have upheld, perhaps, secret combinations. We have... Um, put them in positions that says they, we've allowed them to get above us, or if we allow them to get above us, how in the world could that happen? How could you ever allow somebody with that kind of a background to get above you? And that's worth thinking about. Um, perhaps we do it in, uh, in government, could we? And that's what, uh, what again, Helaman said. Um, uphold them in their philosophies, We'll talk about some of the philosophies of the secret combinations here in a minute, but there are philosophies involved here that perhaps we have succumbed to unknowingly. Well, then he says, and we're going to kind of end on this note, but he says this, if that has happened, he said, the sword of justice of the eternal God shall fall upon you to your overthrow and destruction if ye shall suffer these things to be. I don't know what that means exactly. The sword of justice of the eternal God shall fall upon you if ye allow these things to be. I suspect those are some of the things that we read about in the scriptures about some of the latter-day peril and some of the prophecies of things that will take place. This is not meant to be a doom and gloom talk, and that's not the point. It's to become aware of the same thing the prophets wanted you and I to be aware of. And so when he says that, the sword of justice falling upon us, he goes on to say, The Lord commandeth you, when ye shall see these things come among you, ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation because of this secret combination which shall be among you. He doesn't say if it is, he says it shall be among you. He does say one other thing I think is very instructive. It cometh to pass that whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom, and then he, he amplifies things. He's not just talking about the promised land here. He says it seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries, and it bringeth to pass the destruction of all people, for it is built up by the devil. That's fairly powerful, isn't it? In fact, as I read scriptures in the Book of Mormon, that's one of the most powerful set of scriptures I think I've read because it doesn't pull any punches. It simply says, this is what is happening. Here's why it's happening. It happened to us. And you Latter-day readers, be careful because that same secret combination is well and alive. Well, that's uh, to me, that's sobering. I'm sure it's sobering to you too. Steve, if you don't mind, I'm going to read that letter that uh, I've read before and when you've been here. This is a letter really was sent to him, wasn't sent to me. He let me have it and I published it. <clears throat> Does that make it nine-tenths mine? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we had an experience a while back. Christopher Bolin. Has anybody heard of Chris Bolin? Several of you have. And a good man, not a Latter-day Saint, just a good man who is an investigative reporter who has looked at various things that you and I are interested in. One of the things he's been concerned about has been Twin Towers and getting the full story of things happening within Twin Towers. And uh, Steve, I'm just going to tell a story on you here, but uh, he had come to, uh, to Dr. Jones at one point and was asking him about, uh, about Twin Towers and so forth. And then 
Um, in the process, Steve, as I understand it, uh, he had asked you, uh, how can you be so definite about these things? And you had then given him a copy of the Book of Mormon. And that copy of the Book of Mormon, as I understand, was all pre-marked with some neat scriptures coming from Helaman and from, from Ether and others. And so he went back and he read those. And I had the opportunity of also working with, with uh, Chris Bolin. He came out to where I was at one time in, in Heber City, and we sat down and we had breakfast, which turned into lunch, and, and just a real neat individual. I really appreciated him. Then he wrote back to, uh, to Brother Jones, and here's what he said. As I told you when we met in Provo, the LDS Church has an advantage over other Christian churches in that it has the prophetic warnings of the secret combinations and the Gadianton robbers taking over the complete control of the government. To my mind, that makes the LDS Church the most relevant Christian church on the planet. It requires its followers to do something about our awful situation brought on by the Gadianton robbers. How do you feel about that? Here's a non-member who is pointing fingers saying, you are the most relevant Christian church on the planet and you're required to do something about that because you have an inside knowledge that not everyone else has. He said, most non-Mormons don't have, the, have a clue what is meant by these terms from the Book of Mormon, but they, are very, they very much need to know what is written and meant by them. As Ether chapter 8, verse 16, this is what I like about Chris, he just quotes scripture left and right. As Ether chapter 8, verse 16 says, And they, the secret combinations, were kept up by the power of the devil to administer these oaths unto the people, to keep them in darkness, to help such as sought power, to gain power, and to murder, and to plunder, and to lie, and to commit all manner of whoredoms. And then he says, Monette concludes the chapter on secret combinations with this, Further, because the Lord will hold us accountable for upholding and suffering the secret combinations to exist, he will certainly reveal their acts, their purposes, and ways that we may be effective in combating their influence. The Lord has given you the knowledge and the wisdom to help reveal the secret combinations behind 9-11 and our awful situation. Isn't that an interesting letter? I think it is. And uh, I think here's a man who understood some of the things that you and I are responsible also for understanding. Before I get into the rest of the presentation, let me just add, tell you about some sources that I like, and uh, I don't know if you are into reading more in depth or not, but if I don't say it now, I'll forget to say it later. So one of the sources that I like to use is Carol Quigley. Are all you familiar with Carol Quigley? And he wrote the book Tragedy and Hope several years ago. This has been 40 years ago that he wrote the book. And in the book, he says, he speaks from an insider point of view, saying, here is what the, the uh, group that I am working with, the, uh, some call them Illuminati, some call them the uh, combination of sorts, the, uh, the power brokers, powers that be, whatever. Um, this is what their plan has been, here's the way they've accomplished it, and here's where they're going. I enjoy reading him. Unfortunately, it's a very rare book, very difficult to get. However, if you get a hold of uh, two other books, they discuss it quite openly. And they are Cleon Skousen's book, um, The Naked Capitalist. And if you have that, wonderful. It's been reprinted. Uh, if you can't, haven't been able to find it lately, it has been reprinted the last six months. And the other one that's a very good one on that is None Dare Call It Conspiracy by Gary Allen written back in 1971, but still very true today because most of it's historical. Uh, another book I'd recommend very highly is one by uh, G. Edward Griffin, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Some of you may have heard of that. It uh, does an excellent job talking about some of the things we'll be talking about now. Uh, another one that's, uh, that I find very good is Ellen... Hodgson Brown, and she's been giving the seminars quite a bit lately. She's been down in Arizona recently. I don't know if she's been throughout Utah or not, uh, but she has written a book that I like, and written several books, but the one I like best is called Web of Debt, and she gets into the banking issue, and she talks about the individuals who are responsible for some of the, the mess that we have today, and uh, we can appreciate that in our banking world. Okay. So with that, let me, uh, let me put up here on the board 
some things that I think all of us would find that we would agree on. If there were secret societies today, what would they want to do? First of all, you'd have that's over here. You would have the uh, the group itself, and you would say the goal of any group that would consider themselves to be of that gender. There, the, again, the the Gadianton robbers. Uh, what do we call them? Powers that be? Anything you want to call them, but you know who I'm talking about. What would the goal be? And I, most can can go back to some things. Yeah. Number one is uh, the overall objective is what? Control of money. Further than money, the world, literally. Yeah. So so you have yeah all people or let let's just say the world is literally the goal of uh, to control the world. That sounds uh, ridiculous, doesn't it? Who in the world could even fathom wanting to control the world? Can you think of anybody in history that's ever wanted to do that? Well, I guess there have been a few, haven't there? You know, we talk about Alexander, we talk about the, uh, the Romans, you talk about uh, the Muslims, um, Hitler. Yeah, there are several people, I guess, over the years who have really wanted to control the world, and that seems to be the primary goal, is to control the world. In controlling the world, you do that through... This isn't going to work. Um, you do that through different means. And the primary one, somebody said money. Did I hear that? Okay, if you can control the finances, obviously you have great control over everyone, don't you? If I can control your wallet, I can pretty well tell you what you're going to do next. So, money becomes one area of control. Anything else? What would you have to control? Media, thank you. And we'll get into the media and the importance of that, extremely important. Yes. Education, thank you. Yeah, we've got to bring these people up with a set of ideals and values, don't we? Yes. The what? Yeah, that's periphery, but you're right. Um, yeah, literally all production. Um, what? To, to a large, you know, all of these things, what I'm finding, you know, things that you're mentioning are extremely important. They all seem to interweave. They all go back together at some point. Yes, in the back. Yeah, the, the overall is back here. In fact, we just read that, didn't we, in Ether chapter 8. We have all nations, lands, and people, and what are we going to take away from them? Their freedom. What did Satan want to take away from us in premortal existence? Our freedom. And he's doing a good job. Yes. Religion. You know... This is an issue. It's becoming more and more of an issue, I think, as you look. I'm, I'm not going to discuss that too much here in this, in this presentation, but religion is an issue, a one-world religion. Let me put down the other ones I had. Government, definitely. Control of government. Oh, that's really five. Um... And then I've got two other things down here that are very important. They go hand in hand with it, <coughs> which gets into government, but war and the, the geography of things, the geography of the world. Edwin Stanton, remember who he is, you Lincoln buffs here? Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, made a statement one time, and he said, war is not to vanquish the enemy, it is to create a situation. Interesting. Think about that. So we have wars, and then lastly, that's done through a particular philosophy that we had mentioned earlier, and the philosophy is socialism. 
Now, there, and obviously much deeper than socialism, but for our benefit here, for our purposes, let's talk about that. Now, in that, what I'd like to do is just draw some lines here and look at the way the encroachments have been done. For example, if we were to talk about money, and now we're going to talk, uh, let's go back 200 years. And we said, here's a group of people who said, number one, I want to control your money, the printing of your money, the value of your money. What would your reaction have been? <laughs> well, your reaction probably would have been, the heck you say. You know, that's my money. I keep my money. I work for that, and that's mine. Media. I will control the media. Somebody says that to you. You say, no, I want fair reporting. I want to know what to believe in, what, which way I should go. I want to control education. We say, no, no. Education is to learn all that we can learn, but in an environment where we aren't controlled. Religion, let's get back to that. Government want the, the, uh, the desire to control government. How do the Nephites feel about that? Remember Nephi when he's writing there about uh, Helaman 7, and he talks about what happens in the government, and woe is me, I wish I could have lived back in the days when people were so much more easily being treated. He didn't remember. But the point was that it was, it was very demoralizing to go to government and not be able to trust government. How would you feel today if somebody said, I want to control government, you have no say? Well, I guess you already know that. Okay, and then... Number six here, wars. Somebody were to say, <clears throat> we will control the warfare, we'll get you into war, we'll get you out of war at certain times. Again, a power from above, not you saying, I think we better fight. All these things, socialism. Socialism used to be a very negative word, a very nasty word back in the 50s when I grew up. It's not a negative word anymore, is it? That's just the way things are. Well, I guess, what? <coughs> Yeah, and we'll talk about communism because that fits in very closely here. The, the whole thing is here that these things, were they presented to you and I, uh, you know, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, all of us would have said, no way. We simply will not allow these things to happen. Now, have they happened? Well, I wonder how they could have happened if we we're all against it. Um, as, as you look at this. Now, here, this would be... The goal, let's see, is this going to write? I can never get these things to do what they're supposed to, what I'm supposed to. Um, <laughs> that's why there's so many of them, huh? Um, ah, they're rare. Okay, this is supposedly a timeline. And at the end, we're going to call this one Oh, you know, I failed to put one down here, which is the main one here. World dominion, or sometimes we call that one world. You ever heard that term? One world. Um, and this would be the, the concept here of one world. In other words, one world, not several nations broken up, but one government over one world. One philosophy, everybody shares the same thing in that world. And then the, the end down here is complete control having accomplished one world. Dominion. Okay. Then we have, put some of the other ones up here. Let's put media. And... How do we get media to accomplish that? Let's put socialism. And it's getting fainter and fainter, but you can see it. And then wars. Hmm. Okay, well, there is a line here. Uh, and the other one I wanted to put down would be... Uh, Money, sure, money. Um, that says money, and that is a line going across there. Okay. Now, those things, looking at them, what I want to do is more or less build a continuum. 
showing how these various things have happened and how they've, they really have accomplished what their intent was way back here. When we say way back here, it's pretty hard to get a starting place, but we can. Um, some like to use 1776 as a starting place. Why 1776? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, some like to use that. Uh, from Adam Weiskopf, uh, back in, thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. This does say money, and I wanted to emphasize that. Okay. Yeah, uh, it could have started then. We don't know. In fact, prior to that time, we know that there are secret groups functioning. The secret groups that we'll be talking about today really won't be named by name so much. We do know this. We can go to a Rothschild family, and we can say, yeah, that's probably where much of this occurred. In fact, if you look at the whole concept of one world, we go back to the Rothschilds. Now we're talking about the, oh, the mid-1700s. And very early, what did they do? You have Amschel Rothschild, who is the founder there, has a great deal of money. Where did he get his money? War. What war? Napoleon's war. You know where the bulk of it came from, though? England's war against us. Yeah. He was the one who hired all the Hessian soldiers to come in against the United States. Mm -hmm. And so you have this concept here where he gets his money. He's now worth several million dollars. And when you're talking about that in the 17, mid-1700s, that's a lot of money. And at that point, he takes five of his sons. He has five sons, and he sends them out to different places all throughout the world. And those five sons then build financial centers all throughout the world. Interesting. The concept was, let's get the whole world with us here. Very early that comes out. Um, Let's, let's pursue this a little bit here. Um, the idea of one world gets into several things. For example, if you, if you are, it matches wars quite a bit. Um, if, for example, you wanted to conquer the United States, how would you go about doing that through wars? Any idea? They tried it in 1861. And that was an interesting phenomenon. If you go back and you study, and you look at who's on each side, the South as well as the North, we have the same money involved. And that, that's frightening to most people. We thought that was a war of liberation of sorts, when in reality, this whole concept of back to the Rothschilds, um, we find that through various agents and other families coming into things, that the South is represented as well as the North is represented, and things don't go exactly the way they wanted them to. And so by 1865, we finally have a conclusion of the Civil War, but they were there. They were represented on both sides. Um, that things didn't, what they said was this, essentially. Would you rather have a strong government, or would you rather deal with two weaker governments? And they said, we'd much rather deal with two weaker governments, South and North, and so let's go ahead and allow them to divide rather than staying together. And we know what happened. We did stay together. We became one union rather than two separate countries. Well, that was, that was part of the, that was one of the, the only times they've been foiled in that attempt. So then we get a little further on here, and we have certain wars that come up. How many of you are familiar with Albert Pike? Okay, many of you are. And I don't like to bring that in too much because, frankly, I don't know enough about it, except that in 1871, he wrote some very interesting things. And in 1871, he, with those he was corresponding with, were very interested in what war could do to bring the world together under one head. Now, you and I believe in sovereign countries, sovereign nations. Uh, let me... Read you what one author has, has done with that. And uh, to some of you, this will be old hat. Others, I think, will find it interesting. This is another book I recommend, by the way. 
It's called Descent into Slavery by Des Griffin. Excellent book. Very well done. Uh, I think you can only get it online now. Uh, very well recommended by, by several scholars. And he says this. Okay, where did I put my glasses? Somebody see where I put my glasses? I might need them. There they are. Okay. Um, quoting Albert Pike. He said, this plan was outlined in graphic detail by Albert Pike, the sovereign grand commander of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, and the top Illuminatus. What is an Illuminatus, just so we know? The inside group. Um, a Freemasonry in the top Illuminatus of America, and a letter to Giuseppe Mazzini. <clears throat> you know who he was? Italian what? Mafia. He became the founder of the Mafia. Yeah. Doesn't speak too well, does it? Uh, dated August 15, 1871. Pike stated that the First World War was to be fomented in order to destroy Tsarist Russia and to place that vast land under the direct control of Illuminati agents. Russia was then to be used as a boogeyman to further the aims of the Illuminati worldwide. That's an interesting concept, um, but that's what happened. You have World War I that begins in, what, 1914, and you have the Bolshevik Revolution, what year? Anybody remember that? 1917. We often take them apart as two separate things, don't we? We don't combine them together. And yet the same people that were very involved in the First World War and the banking and everything else were the same ones that financed the Russian Revolution. You have Jacob Schiff, you have the Rockefellers, you have several families who were involved in... That's right, from this nation. <clears throat> well, with that, so he said that, that was to... Uh, fomented in order to destroy Tsarist Russia, we want to get rid of that, and to place the vast land under the direct control of the agents. So then he says World War II. I remember written in 1871. World War II was to be fomented through manipulation of the differences that existed between the German nationalists and the political Zionists. This was to result in an expansion of Russian influence and the establishment of a state of Israel in Palestine. Boy, that was written, what, 60 years, or 70 years before it happened? Right on target. I, what? Uh, this particular book is on page 39. Um, so something again to consider here, and I don't really understand all that's happening here, but I do know, again, when you say these things in 1871, you've got some insight. The Third World War was planned to result from the differences stirred up by the Illuminati agents between Zionists and the Arabs. The conflict was planned to spread worldwide. The Illuminati, said the letter, planned to unleash the atheists and provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery and the most bloody turmoil. This is what we're talking about now, I guess. Huh? This, uh, yeah. Then everywhere, the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction, anxious for an ideal but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer. Very interesting. Now, I'm not giving 100% credence to this, but what I am saying is there are some things that are happening behind the scenes that seem to be very accurate about things that are taking place today. And so when we talk about various things in this timeline here, <clears throat> we're going to find that, that very quickly uh, things that seemed very distant and things that we never would have agreed to were somehow planned right in the, the whole movement here. Um, let's talk again about some of those. For example, you have in 1914, you do have that First World War. 
And that goes on for a while. Now, the First World War probably would not have occurred if there wasn't money to fight the war. So where do you get the money to fight the war? We have to do something else, don't we? We have to go to, back to the money chart here, and we find in 1913, just a year before, what act was passed? Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve. Central Banking. You know, I'm always afraid to say Central Bank when I'm in Utah. But get the printing press rolling. And so you have the Fed in 1913, and yet that couldn't have happened without the government agreeing to it, could it? And so, because that had to be a constitutional, uh, not really a constitutional amendment at that time, that comes later, but it did have to uh, go through Congress. One, we don't have... That's what we're going to talk about. Okay. Yeah. And so when we talk about this and what's taking place here, you have to go back now to 1912. Everything happens together. And in 1912, we have a very interesting situation in the United States. We have a president who is a very popular president. His name is William Howard Taft. And those of you who are historians, kind of go back in your mind and remember the history books there. William Howard Taft was the person who had already, he was an incumbent. He had already served one term, and he was fairly popular. But he was not in favor of a central bank. He was not in favor of what we have today in the Federal Reserve. And because of that, we had to shift the organization of the government in such a way that we could have somebody now who would approve of that and get that passed. It had been passed before, it had not had been passed. It had been offered as the Aldrich Bill. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Aldrich Bill, and, and if you do remember that, you'll remember the relationship that Aldrich has, Nelson Aldrich, with some other families. Particularly which family? A Rockefeller, yeah. And so he's part of that group. And he tries to pass a central banking act. Now, what is central banking? What do we mean by central banking? That's what the bankers control the money. The bankers control the money in the sense that they print the money. Isn't that great? Yeah. I would love to have a press like that. Yes. In a simple sense, a central banking, a government regulatory institution that, that regulates all the banks. It regulates all banks in the nation by printing the money, then selling the money, and then charging interest for that money. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a tremendous racket. <clears throat> well, with all of that that's going on here now, you we said 1912. We've got to get rid of William Howard Taft. How do you get rid of a president who is a popular president? That's tough. We have a way to do that, don't we? We've seen that happen a couple times lately. We split the vote. How do you split the vote? You get a third-party candidate, don't you? We have to get a popular third-party candidate. You know, big banking was always done through the Republican Party. And maybe that's still true, although not, not lately. Um, but big, big banking by the Republicans, uh, William Howard Taft didn't go along with it, so they thought, well, maybe there's another Republican that we can use to split the vote but we'll sneak it in through the back door with the Democrat. And so what they did was to get Teddy Roosevelt. Remember, he'd served as president already. He was a popular man, Battle of San Juan Hill. And so with Teddy Roosevelt, you bring him into the fray, and then you run him, those three now. Uh, you have William Howard Taft, you have Teddy Roosevelt, and you take the third party, the man that nobody had ever heard of before, who was named Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, who's he? Well, he's a, a, he's a president, a former president of Princeton University, and he was a two-year governor of New Hampshire. Was New Hampshire, is that it? So this is my, what? New Jersey, thank you. New is new something, rather. <laughs> and so you've got these three who are running now together, and the interesting thing is when, when uh, you get Roosevelt to do this, Roosevelt says, hey, I don't have a platform, I don't have any money, uh, but I would like to be president again. And so you have individuals who are willing to give him some money. And who are they? Well, they're the ones that we're talking about here, the ones that want things to go on. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read this, because I think many of you have read this book already, but essentially what you have is Wall Street, behind Teddy Roosevelt, writing the checks out, 
and saying, here's the money you need, and here's what you say. They review all his speeches. And finally, we have the election. And in the election, what happens? Just exactly what was planned. We have divided the Republican Party, and instead we have now brought in a Democrat that nobody had ever heard of before, but it worked. And so we have Woodrow Wilson, and, you know, we really don't have Woodrow Wilson. Who do we have? Edward Mandel House. You heard of him? President House. And literally, he became the president during that time period. And I challenge all of you who might uh, might want more knowledge on that to go back and just plug that in your computer, Edward Mandel House. And you're going to find some, some remarkable things about a man who was never the president of the country, and yet he probably controlled more and did more things during the administration of Woodrow Wilson to set things in stage for what we have today than anyone else has done. The nobody. Well, 1912, that happens. 1913, we have the Federal Reserve Act. 1914, we have a First World War. You know, you've got to get money here for the Federal Reserve also. And so what else do you have to pass? One more bill, income tax, which you need at that time. 1913, we get the income tax movement rolling. Constitutional, look at your constitution. You, there, there will not be a direct tax applied to citizens of the United States. The income tax is a direct tax. And so it was unconstitutional. In fact, you know that when that went out and it circulated to all of the various states, we had only three states that accepted it the way it was. Every other state that accepted, and they were still shy of what they needed, but every other state said, we will accept it with the following provisions. Not to be a direct tax. And somehow, when they said, we'll accept it only with these provisions, we crossed out these provisions, and they accepted it the way it was. Well, th that's an interesting thing, too. There have been some books written on the income tax, and, uh, and I'm not telling, telling you to go home and not pay your taxes. That's not the point. The point is, we found some things that have happened in our government that really are not very constitutional after all. So with that, you then have the war in 1914. You have the graduated income tax, which I suppose we should call under socialism, should we? Is that socialistic? In fact, we have individuals now who say it's sharing the wealth. And I guess that's what it is. Okay. Now, all of this is taking place is the media active in this? Yeah. Can you control media? Well, any of you who are voting for Ron Paul know the answer to that. Um, media. You know, how do you control media? What did you do back in 1912 to control media? Newspapers. And that was the only source of information, was it, through newspapers. J.P. Morgan... Um, bought, and he's another one that we're talking about here, J.P. Morgan bought the 25 largest newspapers in the United States. Controlling those newspapers, the smaller newspapers, all got their news from those 25 in one sense or another. And so literally he owned all the media in the United States. Boy, what could you do with that? And he did it. And so you have World War I, a very unpopular war, the media gets on board and says, this is a war we have to fight. Those Germans are dirty people. They sunk the Lusitania. All the things that happened during that time. And the media blows that up. Okay. After the war was over, about 1920, what is proposed here with One World? The League of Nations. Notice how it all comes together. This isn't the beginning of things, but it's, it's an easy date for you and I to see what things are, that are interrelate with each other. So in 1920, you have the League of Nations. The League of Nations says, let's all get together and we'll talk things over and we'll never have to worry about wars again. It was the idea of peace in our time. In fact, that was what, uh, what Wilson said was the, the purpose, peace in our time. Did the United States join the League of Nations? Isn't that great? We didn't. You know why we didn't? Because at that time... You have the average American who had to memorize certain things from the history books. One of the things they memorized was George Washington's farewell address. You can't even find that in the history books now. 
But the people used to memorize that. My mother memorized that. My father memorized that. And your grandparents did too. And with that, they found George Washington advised against entangling alliances with foreign countries. And they said, Europe's problems are their problems. We don't have any business over there. We're going to stay here. This was introduced, the League of Nations, as a treaty. And we said, we don't want to be involved in a treaty. Well, anyway, that goes along for a while. Now, we know what the media is doing. I'm not going to get all things with that, but that's, that's quite interesting, the people who are involved in media. The socialism, we have a little bit of that that's coming in with the graduated income tax. More of it seems to come in about 1929. What happens in 1929? And I guess we can put that down here, can't we? The stock market crashes. Just one of those unfortunate things, wasn't it? How many of you have, have actually looked at 1929 and the causes? Some of you who have, uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's frustrating to look at because we see a lot of it happening today, unfortunately. Money can be manipulated. And are you, are you sure you're taping this, Brian? Maybe you shouldn't. Money can be manipulated. In fact, if you go back to the booms and busts, uh, there were many uh, over the time period from 1837 forward, booms and busts, depressions and periods of, of abundance. And what you have is a contraction of money and then a release of money. Why would anybody who had authority over money contract it sometimes and release it other times? There's tremendous control. You know, what? You, I've got a son. Let me just, just share, share my son with you. My, my son good young man, and he makes a lot of money, and makes more than I ever thought of making. But in his wealth, he's decided he would do what so many others do. You put it in the stock market, you buy real estate, and of course you buy it on leverage because you can buy more that way. And so he just really got strung out with money because things were good. Do you remember about three or four years ago, things were good. And so he spent money on all these things, well, what happened? All of a sudden, the real estate market went down, the stock market went down, and they're calling him on all the things that he owes, and where do, where do all his assets go? Unfortunately, they go back to the banks, don't they? And so when you have the boom and bust, the contraction of credit, you have the release of credit, you find that people can continue. It's been a, a story over and over again in civilization. You spend during the good times, and whoops, when the bad times come, it never fails. You just aren't quite ready for it. And so the boom and bust cycles, which happened in 1837, you have it in 1857, you have it in 18, what, uh, 93, you have it, in 1907, you have it, 1929, you have it. Those are all different, different uh, depressions that we have gone into as a country. But we find that the rationale for that, the reason for that is, whoops, there just isn't any money. We can't give any loans out now. Yes, we gave them out before, but because the money isn't free, you'll just have to make other arrangements. Anyway, that, that has happened over and over. So 1929 was really a big one. But you remember why the Federal Reserve was organized? It was just after the Depression of 1907. And they said, we are here now, and it'll never happen again. Well, it did. And so in 1929, you have a period of a bust. Now... Maybe that's like wars. Maybe it's not necessarily to vanquish the enemy, but to create a situation. Was there a situation created by the Depression, 1929? What was the situation? People turned to government. You've got to help us out of this. We're really in bad shape. And so we had government programs that really mounted at that time. And they have become the forerunners of many of the things that you and I are seeing today. In fact, I've heard so often on the, uh, the news about FDR and how we wish we could go back to those days of FDR and maybe our new president will do things like that. I think I'm among friends. Um, so in 1929, you have that problem. 1931, we're concerned about money here. 1931, we decide that maybe gold isn't such a good idea. After all, we go off the gold standard. Remember what the problem was with gold? People couldn't keep it. What happened to it? 
It was taken by the government. And what was, if they didn't turn it into government, what happened to them? There was actually a 10 year prison term if you were found keeping gold. I'm not sure that was ever applied. I don't know that it was. I know that, uh, that my grandpa put a few pieces in his sock, and, <clears throat> and I'm glad he did. Um, but generally, again, you have that whole thing of gold going off. Now the, the dollar bill is no longer backed by gold, but we do keep it backed by silver until when? 1964. And so you have the money here, the Fed printing their own money, gold back initially, 1929, now we can get rid of the gold, 1964, up the road here, now we can get off the silver standard, 1971, we let that float with the world economy, and we have dollars now that you and I have in our wallets, and what's behind them? Paper, good faith, yeah. Yeah, it says made in USA, maybe made in China, I don't know. Um, my, my daughter, my daughter-in-law works for the, the uh, Bank of Shanghai, Hong Kong, and, uh, and she's, she gives me information all the time on things that are happening abroad now with money, and it, it's not going to get better, trust me. Well, with these, these various things here, we know 1914 we had a war, 1929 we don't have a war, but they're kind of wishing there might be. Uh, 1939, you have the invasion of Poland, um, and 1941, America enters the war. Now, we entered the war in 1914 because Americans wanted to enter the war? No. They were told a couple of things again. Germans are bad people, and they were told the Lusitania was sunk by a German U-boat who was simply um, taking advantage of a pleasure cruiser. We know now that wasn't true. Lusitania was what? It was a warship, wasn't it? It was a warship full of ammunition. 1941, Pearl Harbor takes place. We were attacked, Day of Infamy. Or as one person wrote in a book, Day of Deceit. How could there be deceit involved? Many think that the whole concept of the of Pearl Harbor and the attack on Pearl Harbor, if you go back and you look at the records, and in my book I go through about three or four pages on that, showing that in reality we set ourselves up for that. It was, uh, it's rather amazing as you read Pearl Harbor and all the things surrounding Pearl Harbor that we could literally leave people open to that kind of invasion and things that took place there. The thing, you know, it's, if you want to read some good church book, uh, work on this, J. Reuben Clark, member of the First Presidency at that time, spoke out quite vehemently about the things we're talking about right now. This isn't just us through hindsight several years later. At the time, people knew what was going on. And in the church, people knew what was going on. All right, you have 1941 here. And boy, 1941, the war begins, 1945 it ends. And yet you have up here, in this one world, you have a group. And the group actually began in 1920. The initials are CFR. <coughs> what does that stand for? Council on Foreign Relations. And the Council on Foreign Relations in 1920, as they began, said, we will do things now to help the world understand things going on in the world scene here, and especially the United States. That was the United States organization. In 1939, they are commissioned by the government, by our president at that time, to set up a committee on post-war problems. You getting something funny in the dates there? The year is 1939, and they're set up as a committee to discuss post-war problems. We haven't even entered the war yet. It'll be two more years before we enter the war. And you know what they come up with from 1939 forward? A document that they're going to use in 1945, which is what? The UN Charter. Now, we haven't got time to go into all this. In fact, I'm going to beg off here pretty quick. 
let me just give you a real quick smattering of things that take place. This is, for a historian, this is kind of fascinating how all this happens. Remember these things over here? They'll never happen. We don't want them to happen. They can't happen in our country. Have you noticed the way they happen? And there's always a reason behind it. In 1945, we are the ones who pretty well set the stage for the United Nations. The primary author of the document is who? Anybody remember? A man named Alger Hiss. Yeah. What do we know about Alger Hiss? What? Definitely a traitor. If you, how many of you have read the Witness, Whitaker Chambers? Anybody read that? I commend that book to you, just, just to understand things that are going on during that time period. Whitaker Chambers, Pumpkin Papers, does that ring a bell? No. Okay. Got to read that. Because what we're talking about is the communist influence that takes place during the Roosevelt administration. Roosevelt's closest advisor at that time is a man named Lachlan Curry. That may, name may not ring a bell, but he later on admitted he was a communist. What are communists doing in the White House? You have Harry Dexter White, who becomes the, uh, the Undersecretary of the Treasury. Harry Hopkins, who is a very close friend of the President's. These people all later on say, yeah, we're communists, so what? Do you see a problem with that, or is that just me? And so you have, uh, in fact, you have Joe McCarthy. You've all heard of Joe McCarthy. Bad guy. He's communists under every bed. Okay. There are two schools of thought, aren't there? I went on the web, and I put in Joe McCarthy. And what do you think I got back? This guy is a jerk. He sees communists everywhere. The poor guy can't see straight. Got to get rid of him. He ruined America because of the witch hunt that he was on. Others say, wait a minute, he was right. When he said there were over 200 people in the State Department that were communists, card-carried communists, he was right. And frankly, you know, a few years later, all that came out, and they knew that, never exonerated McCarthy for it. Interesting. Well, what's communism got to do with all this? We didn't even mention communism over here, did we? There are two ways to get socialism ingrained. What are they? The sword communism or what's called Fabian socialism. What's Fabian socialism? Another way to approach it. Do you think we've become involved in Fabian socialism? Fabian socialism is simply, let's do it a bite at a time. Let's do things like food stamps. Let's do things like, like other welfare, poor um, you know, dependent mothers, that sort of thing. And so one by one, we stack programs in there. Does that sound like something going on today? In the new stimulus package, there are over 200 bureaucracies being created. Are you aware of that? 200 federal bureaucracies. The majority of those having to do with socialism in one form or another. We said we'll never accept that. And here we are right in the middle of it. And so this thing does go on. What I, the reason I said this is so interesting here is because you have these individuals who are communists, and once they accomplish what they need to accomplish, they back away. I'm going to read one more thing, and then we'll turn time over to you for questioning. Some of you may have read, you might be in luck. Okay. I have another book here, I thought, by Jeffrey Griffith. Here it is. Oops. This was written in 1961. And this is Joseph Stalin. Who's Stalin? Okay. Premier of Russia. And he was the one who's involved at the... I lost my glasses again. He was the one who was involved at the Treaty of Yalta and several other treaties when they determined the Russian position after World War II. He said this, here is the goal that we have, written in 1961. Number one, bring all nations together into a single world system of economy. Is that happening? This was written again, what, 61, almost 50 years ago. Number two, Force the advanced countries to pour prolonged financial aid into the underdeveloped countries. 
Boy, and that's that's going to get bigger. Have you heard of the Global Poverty Act? Okay, if you haven't heard of it, you soon will. And this, uh, you think some of the things are big right now going on, it's going to even be worse. And number three, divide the world into regional groups as a transitional stage to total world government. Regional groups. Have you heard of that? Well, we're, we're talking about the NAU now, aren't we? Uh, and several others, European Union. So divide the world into regional groups as, as a transitional stage to total world government. Populations will more readily abandon their national loyalties to a vague regional loyalty than they will to a world authority. Later, the regionals um, can be brought all the way into a single world dictatorship of the proletariat. Written almost 50 years ago. Now, some people say can, there is no such thing as a conspiracy. And I, I go back to, and maybe you do too, President Ezra Taft Benson. And you recall what he said about a conspiracy? He said this, in the Book of Mormon, there is no conspiracy theory. There is only conspiracy fact. And he went on to say, in our day and age, who are we to think that there are no conspiracies around? We tend to look down. If I have a good friend who gives lectures like this, and he says every time he says the word conspiracy, people look at their feet, and they look up at the ceiling, and nobody wants to look in the eye. <clears throat> and he said, I stopped calling it conspiracy. He said, now I simply say things were orchestrated in such a way. Think about it. Um, we'll end on this note from section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants. If you have your scriptures, you might look, look here also. In section 88, there is an admonition given to the School of Prophets. We have taken that admonition to be given to you and I today. And in 88, here's what the Lord says. I'm going to go to, uh, oh, let's start about 78. The Lord said this, Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you. Remember that? that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory and principle and doctrine in the law of the gospel in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God that are expedient for you to understand. He doesn't put a period there. He keeps right on going. Understand this is all one sentence of things both in heaven and in the earth and under the earth. Things which have been, things which are, things which must shortly come to pass, things which are at home, things which are abroad, the wars and the perplexities of the nation. Don't you like the way he writes that? The perplexities of the nations. And the judgments which are in the land, and a knowledge also of countries and kingdoms. No period yet. That you may be prepared in all things when I shall send you again to magnify the calling, for unto I have called you and the mission with which I have commissioned you. So often we look at those scriptures and we say that's missionary work. And we learn these things to become better missionaries, to teach the gospel. I'm not sure where learning about wars and the perplexities of the nations helps us be a better missionary to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I do know that knowing those things helps a great deal to understand the things that are going on today. And then doing the next thing that it says here. Behold, I sent you forth to testify and to warn the people. It becometh every man who hath been warned to warn his neighbor. When we know these things, when we can make a study the way the Lord has told us to, we can then warn our neighbor. I was talking to Joel Skousen the other day, and Joel said, you know, this conservative movement, talking about conspiracy and so forth, he said, and it's an exciting thing, but we sure get some kooks in this group. And I, I don't know how to phrase that any better than he did. We, we find people that get really excited about the things that you and I are talking about now, but unfortunately, it's with their heart and not with their head. And sometimes people tend to open their mouths when they better find some things out first. Remember what the Lord said to Hiram? You know, first learn it and then preach it. And you and I are in the same position. You and I need to learn these things, know them, awaken to our awful situation. Then once we're awake, then we can help wake up some others, not just with the heart, but again, understanding the things that are going on now. 
and I, I think you do. Anyway, with that, let me turn it over to questioning or whatever. Did everybody hear that? It's a wonderful question. In other words, how do you get, how does this continue the way it does so consistently if you have families involved there, but you go from generation to generation? One thing about the Rothschild family that's very interesting, again, the five children to go out into various phases in the world, but the Rothschilds have another um, mandate among their children. They can't just marry anybody, can they? They have to stay within their own family. They can marry cousins, but they have to stay within their own family. They can never be, uh, never be made an accounting of their wealth. See, all those things become very secret. They can now marry into other families, other big banking families, and that's all. We look at the, the Rockefellers. Rockefellers are quite interesting. Again, everything's in a trust, isn't it? And not just the Rockefellers, again, the Schiffs and the Morgans and so forth, but you have all things controlled in a trust. And because of that, the trust has certain guidelines to it. And so if they want their money, they pretty well have to play ball. But if you're raised from being that high and you have those ideals, you'll probably stay with it. And they do, yes. Uh, this is very important to understand. Again, you're right. The main families stay in the background. Most of us don't know who they are. When's the last time you came across Rothschild in the news? You won't. Yeah. And with other families, it'll be the same way. However, you're right. <clears throat> you get into the groups, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, several others. You get in certain names. Henry Kissinger is going to be there. David Rockefeller is there for quite a while. You sit, come across certain names, and they're the tip-off. But we don't have the actual, all the data on who's doing what. But excellent question. And all we know is it's loosely held, but at the same time very tightly held. And we know this. If you go back to what, what they said in Ether chapter 8, who's at the head of it? And Satan runs a very tight ship. And, and that is, that, unfortunately, that's another Gaddy Anton rule, isn't it? Yes. You don't do it. Yes, Sister Thompson. Of course, we have section 134 of the Doctrine and Covenants that tells us why governments are instituted. And they're all there for a reason. But Heavenly Father doesn't bridge the gap, does he, and say that all these can be the same together. You know, I didn't, and I should have brought this out before. We talk about socialism, wherever that is right here. Socialism becomes controllable. If you have capitalistic markets in all different countries, they are not controllable. Does that make sense? If a media is aiming toward this, and this is what we know, that's what we'll understand, all these various things here tend to converge in a one-world government. You know, and to answer your question, that's, that's a great deal. But here's where I think we are. Um, let me share a situation with you. I had a, a man, well, I was very close to an older gentleman who had served uh, several missions for the church, just a good, righteous man. When I first came out with this book, he was walking by Sam Weller's up in Salt Lake, and he saw my book in the window. And he said, oh, I know the author. Let me buy that book. And so he did. He went home and he read it, and he came to church the next day or the next uh, couple days, whatever. And I was teaching gospel doctrine at the time. And he came up to me, and he was quivering, shaking, holding the book in front of me. And he said, Brother Monette, I read it. I believe it. What do I do about it? All of us have asked that question, haven't we? And I've been asked the question before, and I just kind of gave some flip answers. <laughs> I apologize. Anyway, I made that a matter of prayer. I went to my Father in heaven, and I said, Father, what do I tell people when they ask the question? What do I do? There's so much out there. There's so many fronts. What do I do? And the answer is given to me very strongly. My job was simply to help to awaken. From that point on, you and I have the, the uh, commission to go to our Father in Heaven saying, Father, here's what I see. What should I do? Now we can ask some intelligent questions. It's not a matter of, Heavenly Father, do I vote Democrat or Republican? That's not what you're asking. What you're saying is, there is something going on out here, and I know in the latter days that the elders of Israel have a responsibility. 
and I want to be part of the solution to that responsibility. And I know, and I think everyone here knows, when you go with that attitude and you've done your homework, you get answers. I've got answers, and I think all of us have. The neat thing is, everyone here has different talents and abilities. Everyone here is going to get a different answer. And that's the good part about it. Your answer is not going to be his answer, nor my answer. Yeah. But that's what it's all about. Thank you, Dr. Manette. Thank you. In closing, I'd like to echo what's been said. And in answer, as I was thinking about it, there's two things that I've thought as well. And I'm going to use your scriptures if you don't mind. <clears throat> I was teaching gospel doctrine Sunday, and this, came, this actually came to, to mind as well, so I'm going to reread it. Nephi tells us what we are to do. And turn my page. And now behold, my beloved brethren, I suppose that you ponder somewhat in your hearts concerning that which you should do after you had entered in by the way. If the fact that we are here means that there has been a process that we've, there's certain things we've accepted, there's been things that we've gone to, there's been truths that we've held, we wouldn't be here otherwise. We've entered in by a certain way. But behold, why do you ponder these things in your heart? Do you not remember that I said unto you that after you had received the Holy Ghost, you could speak with the tongue of angels? And how could you speak with the tongue of angels, save it were by the Holy Ghost? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. Remember I say unto you, feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things in which you should do. Wherefore now, after I have spoken these words, you cannot, and if you cannot understand them, it will be because you ask not, neither do you knock. It will be different for every single one of us. Each one of us come here to the battle for freedom from a different place. We come here from the, the battle for freedom from different experiences. The Lord will not have us all work in the same part of the vineyard, and he will have us work in different parts. I am often reminded of Alma when holding two positions as the chief priest of the, of the church and also above the high priest of the land and of, of the, the, high, the, the chief judge of the land, gave up his chief judge position to preach the gospel because there became an inequality in the land. And rather than passing more laws, he decided to go about and to preach the, the gospel. That is what we are doing tonight. That is what Dr. Manette has done for us tonight. Because he has gained a testimony, he has gained knowledge, and he has imparted that to us. May we also do the same. The Freedom Society is established that we will have forums like this quite often. And I would suggest that if you would, you can check it out on uh, online on uh, clubs.byu.edu.